Okay, so um, welcome everyone to this week's uh, TCS Plus with um, Santosh Dempala. Before we begin, let me um, just uh, quickly thank uh, my co-organizers. Uh, Thomas Fiddick is here, being the operator, and India Day is also here. Um, and behind the scenes, we have, we have G. Kamat, uh, Clement Canon, and uh, and uh, Rosenstein. Um, also, let me remind you of the next a uh, few talks. So we have in two weeks uh, Avishai Tal um, from the IS, and um, two weeks after that we have Mohsen Gaffan, uh, Gaffari will um, will speak. Yes, uh, here's like the science. Yeah. Do you want to quickly go around the table? Yeah. I'll try to take care of that noise in the meantime. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for that. So it's a pleasure to have uh, lots of you joining us today. So we're going to go around the table. We have uh, an India Day uh, working behind the scenes from Chicago. Uh, then we have Chen Tsai, I believe, from uh, Stony Brook joining us. Um, then there is a group led by DJ, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, DJ Boop from uh, Georgia Tech. Um, then we have uh, Dimitris Paparas joining us as often from Wisconsin. Welcome, guys. Uh, then there is um, Esan joining us from USC. Welcome. Um, then we have Janish joining us with a group from Caltech. Uh, well, hey, guys. Um, then uh, Samson uh, Zoo is joining us from a oh, large group from Purdue. Welcome, everyone. Um, then there's uh, Shravas and a group from uh, Shravaslo and a group from NYU. We're almost there. Uh, Sina uh, joining us from Michigan. Uh, welcome, Sina. Uh, and then um, Tong Yang Lee is joining us from University of Maryland. Welcome. So um, I think that's it. Uh, I'll that back to you. OK, thanks, Thomas. Um, so as I was saying, today's speaker is uh, Santosh Vempala. Um, Santosh graduated from uh, CMU in '97 uh, under uh, the supervision of uh, Avram Blum. Uh, he was at MIT for about 10 years uh, before moving to Georgia Tech, where he's now a distinguished professor of computer science. Uh, he won numerous prizes and awards, uh, including the Guggenheim Fellowship, uh, Sloan Fellowship, and he recently became um, was named a fellow of the ACM. Um, Santosh is a uh, world expert in uh, computational aspects of high dimension geometry. Um, and today he'll tell us about one uh, recent work of his with uh, Intat Lee from uh, Stock 2017 um, on the geodesic walk. So uh, welcome, Santosh. Thanks, thanks for that. And thanks for organizing this uh, forum. It's been terrific. I've already watched a couple of talks, recorded talks, and so much nicer than reading the paper <laughs> in some cases. Um, um, just to make sure everybody can hear me, uh, let me see if uh, here's a test. Um, so. Why is the, pr this is something I heard this weekend. Why is the president like an atom? Because he makes up everything. We get that? I can't hear anybody, but I, I, did you hear me? Yeah, I think we hear you. Um, okay, okay. Also, let me okay, take great. the opportunity to tell everyone that Santosh's slides are available for download on the website if anyone wants to use them as a okay. support for his talk. And I guess if people have questions, I'll get, uh, you'll interrupt me somehow and I'll be able to answer them. You'll just hear us. Okay, great. And uh, in the worst case, if uh, you know I'm not able to draw on the screen or draw on the board behind me, uh, I have a, a kind of a more traditional um, approach. So you should be able to see me one way or another. Okay, so this is joint work with Yin Tat Lee. It's been uh, uh, um, a great learning experience working with him. Um, and uh, it's the, the motivation for this uh, for this talk is uh, for this work is a uh, is a uh, classic problem, uh, the complexity of sampling in high dimension. So the dimension for the rest of the talk will be n. And uh, uh, just to state the problem uh, once precisely, you're given a function uh, as an oracle. So for at any point in Rn, you can ask for the value of the function. You know it's, uh, it's, it's uh, non-negative and it's integrable. And it's, uh, you're also given a point x0 where the function has some non-zero value and an error parameter. Epsilon. The goal of the algorithm is to output a point y from a distribution 
uh, that's close to the distribution whose density is proportional to this function f. Since it's integrable, there is such a density, and it's a well-defined problem. Now, you could ask what distance. That's interesting, but let's say for now just uh, the usual total variation distance, or L1 distance. So, for example, you might want to sample uniformly from a set, from a compact set or a convex set, or maybe a Gaussian restricted to a set. Um, so this problem is polynomially solvable. The, and the, here is the most general setting that we know. For any log concave integrable function, the complexity of sampling is polynomial in the dimension, log of one over epsilon, and log of the quality of the initial point. Um, you know, if you get a point outside the set, you can't do anything. Uh, uh, so this was shown back already in uh, uh, 1991 by Applegate and Cunnan with an assumption on, the, with a small restriction on the class of functions, they needed them to be Lipschitz. Uh, but this restriction turned out to be unnecessary. So uh, in fact, it's polynomial. This is uh, work with uh, Lovas. Now, um, the problem has a rich history and uh, um, many developments uh, that are mathematically interesting and have led to very nice techniques um, uh, and applications. Perhaps uh, most famous among them is the computation of the volume or integration of high-dimensional functions. But you can also use these methods for optimization, for learning, and so on. So I don't want to uh, go through every uh, development here. But uh, 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 what I want to point out is that uh, if you assume that your starting point is particularly nice, which means, let's say, it's random from a from the set, so it's already from the distribution you want to sample from, and now you want to get an independent new point from the same distribution, then the, the best known time for convex bodies or log concave functions is currently n to the 2.5. Uh, this is a fairly recent improvement, and uh, is, as we'll see soon, conjectured to be n squared. The conjecture is due to Kanan, Lovas, and Shimonovich. Now, uh, but this is in the completely general setting, where the set or the function is given by an oracle, as I described so far. Now, one can naturally ask, what about if you're given an explicit polytope, which is, in fact, the, appears to be the case of most interest. Um, so we'll think of the polytope as uh, given by, the, by, by A and B, and uh, inequalities AX greater than or equal to B. The dimension is N, and the number of inequalities is M. So using these general methods, you get uh, from a very nice start, um, you get and and uh, you get n to the 2.5 uh, total uh, queries, which in our membership queries for a set, uh, and each query in the case of polytope can be uh, answered in time m n just by evaluating a x. So this is the this was the status till uh, till uh, 2009 when Kanan and Narayanan used a different walk. I'll describe that in detail later in the talk. Uh, called the Dickin walk, which takes advantage of the polytope structure and uh, manages to uh, mix the number of steps it takes is only m times n, which can be better when m is not too high. Uh, each step is slightly more expensive. It's uh, it's a matrix multiplication time, basically, of an m by n times an n by n matrix. So it's m times n to the omega minus 1. If you think of m equals order n, and it might be helpful to do that for the rest of the talk, then that's matrix multiplication time. And uh, the main sort of algorithmic consequence of the work I'm presenting today is uh, a new walk. Uh, is the, the consequence is a, is a, is a subquadratic time, so it's m times n to the 3 fourth. And the per step complexity remains the same as the Dickin walk. Um, as we'll see, this is interesting beyond the, the n to the quarter improvement, which maybe is not so appetizing. Um, this is interesting because, uh, uh, at least with the general uh, methods, uh, it's not possible to go below n square, below quadratic. Okay, so here's the plan for the talk. Uh, we'll talk about the ball walk and hit and run, and uh, introduce the geodesic walk. Um, that will be the bulk of the talk, and uh, and uh, um, outline how we bound its mixing time and the cost per iteration. And, and I'll uh, hope to have a few, several minutes for open questions, and there are many. So, how do we sample? 
Well, the nice thing about sampling is that the algorithms are the easiest. That you just walk randomly in Markov chains. So the ball walk is the following process. At a point x, um, you pick a random point y uh, from the from the ball centered at x of radius delta, the the, the, the ball of radius delta in, in Rn. And if that point is still in the set, you go there. Otherwise, you uh, do nothing. Now, we're, our, our um, goal here for the rest of the talk is the uniform distribution over a given uh, polytope um, or, or, or convex set. Um, now, this walk is symmetric. The, the probability density of transitioning from x to y is the same as y to x. And so uh, the stationary distribution is as desired uniform. Um, uh, this is the quick one uh, slide primer on Markov chains. Um, so um, a good time for many of you to to watch something else perhaps. But here, here it is. You have a state space, a next step distribution, uh, which for every point in the state space, it tells you what is the distribution for where you will go in one step. And then um, given a distribution, there is an ergodic flow, um, which is just uh, the total flow out of a subset. So uh, when you pick according to the distribution Q. Right, so this is the probability from a point U of going to the complement of the set A and summed up over all points in the set. So it's a total flow out of the set. And uh, distribution is stationary if um, uh, for every subset, measurable subset, the flow in is the same as the flow out. Now, the important parameter in analyzing the, the, the mixing rate, the, the number of steps you need is the conductance. And uh, this is the, the flow out of a subset normalized by the smaller of the probabilities of the subset and its complement. So assuming the subset is measured less than half, this is the conditional escape probability. Given that you're in this set, what's the chance that the next step will take you outside? And the infimum over all subsets is the conductance of the Markov chain. Now, the, to summarize why this is uh, useful, um, we can uh, look at the following theorem due to Lovas and Shimonovich, uh, generalizing Jerome and Sinclair from the discrete setting to this uh, uh, ge uh, general setting. If you look at the distribution after t steps, starting from some initial distribution q0, then depending on the distance of the initial to the final, you get a bound which decays exponentially with the inverse of the, you know, with the, with the, with the gap. Uh, uh, you know, this is this is corresponds to the spectral gap, but all it's saying is that uh, if the conductance is phi, then your decay rate is one over phi squared. So every one over phi squared steps, your distance is going down by a constant. You, this particular notion of initial distance to final distance or initial distance is perhaps uh, restrictive because you want a pointwise bound. But instead, you could look at uh, an average version of this, or in fact, uh, equivalently, the chi-squared distance. And that is also enough to get a bound on the final total variation distance. Um, and the rate of um, uh, convergence is linear. Okay, so the quantity we'd like to bound is the conductance. In the convex setting, it looks like this. Our state space is the set of points of the polytope or the convex set. And then we look at an arbitrary subset S, and you're asking what's the probability of transitioning out. Now, which points are likely to transition out? The ones that are close to this boundary of this subset and Right? The ones that are close to the boundary of the subset. Okay. Uh, and then each of them has some probability of transitioning out. So really it depends on two things. First, we try to show that points that are nearby have a large overlap in their one step distributions. So if I take a point here and a point on the other side, if they're close by, and this statement is true, that given that they're close by, they're likely to overlap after one step, then there's a good chance that they will cross over. And, and that, that's one part of it. The second part is, in fact, there are a large uh, number of points near the boundary. And, and since we're looking at conditional escape probability, the chance of escaping normalized by the measure of the set, we want to show that large subsets have large boundaries. And this is a purely geometric property, usually called isoperimetry. And we're just looking at it in the geometric setting. So that's the high level two things we'd need to bound the conductance. OK, so for the ball walk, using these methods, it's, it's polynomial. And in fact, here is the current best from a warm start. So now you know what warm means, that the distribution 
is uh, uh, of the of the initial point is already close to random within a constant factor let's say in terms of the density of being random or on average and from a warm start here are the current best bounds you can sample in time n squared d squared or number of steps n squared d squared for any convex body of diameter d containing the unit ball or if you assume further that the body is isotropic or near isotropic so it's a covariance matrix is uh, close to the identity then in fact it takes you n to the 2.5 it's conjectured to be n squared it's it, this will follow if the kls hyperplane conjecture is true and uh, each step here is a membership call so as we said before for a polytope it's m times n so that's the ball walk now you could ask why are we stopping at n squared why isn't it faster the mn is clear just membership takes that much why why n squared and the reason is simply the single step so here was the process now the point is that if the next candidate point is not in the set you do nothing so an important quantity to bound is the probability of doing nothing or doing something and uh, the step size simply cannot be too large because otherwise the rejection probability becomes too high you could imagine um, a, a point near the corner of a cube and uh, even if the point lies inside if the ball around it is large the probability of stepping out can be exponential and you only have an exponentially small probability of staying in the body so you've got to choose your step size small enough um, um, now uh, we'll come back to this point in a second um, but let's let's consider another process which has also been very interesting to analyze and uh, uh, seems to be faster in practice although uh, has the same um, uh, uh, type of lower bounds so this this walk is the called the hit and run and uh, here's what it does um, it at every point at any point X you pick a random chord so a random unit vector around the point X and in that direction find the chord through the point so the point uh, and its boundaries which you can do by, by a simple binary search on the membership oracle at least you can find something close to this and then you sample uniformly from the chord okay now one nice thing about this is that you are making a step every every time so there isn't an issue of uh, um, very little probability of making a proper step uh, and indeed again the, the the walk is symmetric right so the probability of stepping from a point x to a point y well it's uh, proportional inversely proportional to the to picking a direction so this 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 quantity in the denominator is just the area of the sphere and then uh, and two because you can pick a direction or its opposite direction gives you the same chord then this is the scaling factor we'd get ah this this exponent should be n minus one is the scaling factor you get because of uh, distance as at a greater distance the density of picking that particular point is falling uh, with the distance to the n minus one and then this is the inverse of the length of the chord the nice thing is that this formula is actually an equality now the point here though is symmetric in x and y and uh, therefore again the stationary distribution is uniform now you can ask where is the bottleneck after all now there's no uh, explicit step size delta that you have to choose and there is no rejection probability but you have essentially the same effect the point is that the step size you're going to take is on average the the expected chord length so even if your point was random and you took a random direction you can ask what is your chord length that you're going to be taking so it turns out that uh, if, if, even uh, if you have an isotropic body which has a nice unit ball inside and is contained in a ball of mostly contained in a ball of radius square root n the average chord length is still tiny it's only about one over square root n so you, you have essentially the same type of uh, uh, bottleneck as the ball walk um, so in both cases you, you, you your individual steps in isotropic position look like one over root n and this uh, leads to a best possible mixing of n squared, which is basically the open problem. We are at n to the 2.5 in terms of analysis right now. So it's the constraint is due to the points in the boundary, and as I mentioned, even for a cube, right? So if you're um, uh, uh, and you don't have to be really near a corner, uh, if you if you look carefully, it's enough uh, to be close to about square root n boundaries. Okay, so that's the constraint. Now you could say, why are we taking these steps sort of uniformly? You know, the same step size everywhere. Wouldn't it make sense to take bigger steps some places and smaller steps some places, depending on how far you are from the boundary? It's a natural idea. And so it might look like this. For some points, you're uh, taking big steps, and for some points, you're taking small steps. So it seems like you'll move faster. 
Um, what is the problem? Um, if this were fully interactive, I'd wait for the audience, but um, uh, the station distribution is not uniform, right? And uh, why is that? I mean, think about it. You make this step, you go here, you make this step, you go here, and basically all your points will go and stick to the boundary. Um, another way to see it is that if you're at a point here with a small ball, the chance that you come towards the big point, in this case, let's say zero, whereas from here to there, there is a chance that you go there. So um, you, in, in, in effect, you, your stationary distribution is concentrated near the boundary. And that makes sense. Uh, indeed, it's, uh, it should be um, proportional to the ratio of the transition probabilities in the two directions. And uh, however, we can correct this using a standard uh, trick in uh, Markov chains called the Metropolis filter. So rather than moving for sure, let's make these non-uniform steps, but move with the minimum of um, one and the probability of coming back to the going there. So x to y is the probability that you make the current step you're trying to make, and y to x is the probability of coming back. So if you do it with this ratio, then you'll, you, you, the uniform distribution will satisfy this equation uh, with, the, with the new updated transition probabilities. And so in fact, you will still have the uniform distribution as a stationary. Where did we lose? Well, it's possible that this probability of rejection using the Metropolis filter is very small. So now that's the question, how small can it be? So it again, if you correct this, you get the same sort of effect. So let's, let's look for inspiration in a different place. We'll come back to this point. This Metropolis filter will be useful, um, which is uh, the continuous way to do things um, or Brownian motion. If you were in full space, you just uh, make these tiny steps. Imagine your time scale, instead of discrete steps, you're making these infinitesimal time steps. And each step you move according to a, uh, an infinitesimal Gaussian. Okay, for those familiar with it, this type of, this process is what's uh, called a heat equation. Uh, you know, your change in uh, probability over time uh, depends on the divergence of the, of the gradient. Uh, but if you're not, it, it's not, necessarily useful. Um, and now, of course, this is all without boundary, right? I mean, this process, this, this Gaussian is just going uh, going all over space. Um, and what about at the boundary? What do we do if we have boundaries? Right, so as long as you haven't come close to the boundary, nothing happens. But when you come close to the boundary, we need to modify this process somehow to say what happens. One natural thing to do is to reflect at the boundary, right? So if you reach close to a boundary, you actually, uh, take the direction step you're planning to make and if it passes through the boundary instead of passing out you you uh, reflect uh, That process has many nice properties But as far as turning it into an algorithm is concerned you have similar issues you need to use small enough step sizes to discretize and maintain uh, 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 the, These transition probabilities being roughly the same and it doesn't seem to lead to an improvement uh, But here's a second option Rather than reflecting at the boundary, how about we just remove the boundary? What does that mean? Um, so we think of the boundary as a soft boundary where rather than being on the initial polytope or convex body, we're actually going to pretend that we're on the surface that just extends out to infinity near the boundary. So it doesn't, and there is still a one-to-one -one map between any point in your set and any point in this uh, in this on the surface Now in more detail suppose you started with the polytope and this was the polytope and then you uh, You can consider the for a point X. So let's say you're at this point right now the distance to each uh, boundary so if these uh, um, Vectors AI were unit vectors then this slack is exactly the distance and then, you know, you have some distance to each inequality. Those are the slacks. Using those slacks, let's define an explicit function, the log barrier, which is just uh, the log of the reciprocal of the slacks. So it's going up as the slack becomes close to zero and the sum of this. So this function will blow up to infinity near any boundary. And uh, what are drawn here are the level sets of this function. And uh, if you look at it, in this picture, this is the graph of the function. And so the idea is let's walk on this surface which has a one-to-one -one map of the polytope. Okay, sounds uh, interesting. 
And it's, of course, reminiscent, for those who know of it, of the interior point method. In fact, this function is the first uh, clean function to come up in that method. So very quickly, the interior point method for optimization was the following. And since we're drawing in, um, large inspiration from there, let me briefly say uh, a, a two-slide version of it. So you have an objective function, f of x. Let's say it's just a linear function. And uh, you have a linear program. Minimize this function uh, subject to linear constraints. Okay, so here is a picture of the of the of the feasible region, and uh, you're trying to minimize by going down. Say so. This is the objective direction, and the idea is well. The problem is the following: uh, because this boundary, even though it's a convex set, might have all kinds of irregular structure. Um, well, you know, you try to go in the direction of the boundary, so just go as far as you can. You hit a boundary. Now you've got to recompute which way to go. Well, you try to, you know, a natural thing to do is to project the direction and go along. Then you hit another little edge and another little edge and you've got to do lots of computations maybe exponentially many if you're not careful okay so the idea of the interior point method is let's instead have a convex but not just convex a very smooth convex function which doesn't have this type of behavior and we'll add that to the original function but a scaled version of the original function okay so this is a sequence of functions in the beginning this ti will be zero so all you have is this smooth function uh, or very small and gradually we'll increase the ti so by the by the end the contribution of the smooth function is very small and the contribution of your desired objective is very large and how, at what rate do we increase ti we increase it according to uh, some parameter which i'm calling mu here uh, it, it grows up at some geometric rate that depends on this parameter now the nice thing about any of these functions is that you can compute the minimum very quickly now by uh, an iterative simple method in fact even a newton method uh, just using gradients because the function is now smooth and that, that's the point that you can compute this very quickly and looking at this rate you can see that uh, well uh, the number of steps will only be uh, of the order of square root new because every square root new steps you'll be doubling your ti and so you if you want uh, epsilon accuracy you'll need square root new times log one over epsilon a uh, number of steps each step we said is this Newton method. Now the question is, how large can we make these steps? Why not make this new a constant? Well, that depends on how efficiently you can implement each step. And uh, that's an important uh, function of which, important uh, aspect of which barrier function we choose. So the study of barriers is closely tied to this parameter new, and it's called a self-concordance. Overall though, the barriers are having the effect we want. Staying away from the boundary is great because the next step optimization is much easier. There has been, this slide is just to give you a quick sense that there has been a lot of uh, work on uh, barrier functions um, and, their, and their parameters. So the log barrier, which we've talked about, has parameter m, number of inequalities. The universal barrier due to Nemirov, uh, uh, um, Nemirovsky and Nesterov uh, has uh, 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 parameter order n, maybe even n plus 1. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and it uh, works for any convex body, not just polytopes. Um, and n is the best possible. The entropic barrier, analyzed more recently by Bubek and Eldan, has uh, n plus little o n, uh, and can be computed efficiently, at least in polynomial time. The canonical barrier, which is uh, usually uh, look, uh, um, used for cones, has also a small parameter. And in any case, the summary here is that the number of iterations is square root of nu. This, this parameter will show up again of the interior point method. Now, going back to sampling, how are we planning to use these barrier functions? Well, what we want to do is use the barrier functions to define a walk. This is essentially uh, the first walk of this type, the Dickin walk. So what we'll do is, at a point x, we're going to pick a random point y from an ellipsoid centered at x, not a ball, but an ellipsoid. The shape of the ellipsoid will depend on how close the point is to the boundary of the body. And this is the, explicitly the ellipsoid. I'll, I'll, I'll describe it in a minute. And, uh, but the process looks like this. At each step, you pick an, a point from this ellipsoid around you, and now when you go to the new point, you have a new ellipsoid, and you pick from the ellipsoid, that ellipsoid, and continue. Now, um, uh, there's an extra computation, because you have to compute what new ellipsoid is. But uh, at least one would like to know if this is giving you a better rate of convergence. Now, what exactly is this ellipsoid? This ellipsoid is, is the following. This matrix SX is just the diagonal matrix with the slacks. So 
the distance to each constraint of the current point. And so in fact, the, the constraint that this norm of a point y is less than or equal to one is just saying the following. A times y minus x is the same as a y minus b minus a x minus b. So in other words, the slack of y minus the slack of x. So that's what I've written here. Slack of y minus slack of x squared divided by the slack of x squared, which is what this sx inverse is doing. So this is the normalized slack squared of the current point. So rather than measuring distance in the original Euclidean coordinates, you're measuring distance in the normalized coordinates of the current point according to the distances given by the ellipsoid at the current point. So if you were at this point x and you were looking at a certain ellipsoid here, you know, you would measure one unit depending on the length of the axis in that direction. Okay, and so that's what this is doing, normalizing that, and you're saying that should be at most one. Kind of makes sense, right? I mean, uh, you, uh, uh, now with this definition, you never step out, it's clear. You're, you, you never step out, and, uh, 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 but it doesn't work. <laughs> Why doesn't it work? Because again, it's going to converge to the boundary. You see, the ellipsoids that are um, uh, uh, smaller have smaller volume, and the ellipsoids that are bigger have bigger volume, so the probability of transitioning from one point to another is not the same as coming back. And so eventually this will just converge to the boundary. So the way to take care of this is again, the, the metropolis filter, which explicitly just says, go only with probability proportional to the uh, ratio of the ellipsoid volumes. Ellipsoid where you are to the ellipsoid where you're planning to be. And uh, when you do this, then uh, Kanan and Narayanan were able to show that uh, uh, in fact, uh, this mixes and it mixes in, in uh, MN steps uh, from a warm start so if you uh, so so this is the mixing time the number of steps required is m times n as i mentioned this is faster than hit and run when there are not too many facets but a very nice property of the walk is it's that it's a fine invariant you don't have to do any uh, isotropic or other rounding transformation to make things more efficient the walk is the same whether you operate it in the given polytope uh, ax greater than or equal to b or you operate after transforming it by an arbitrary linear transformation, uh, it's exactly the same. So you can virtually pretend that the polytope is already in whatever uh, a fine position you'd like. So, sorry, so, so, can, I, yes. can I ask a quick question? Just to make sure I'm following because you, this seems like just it's exactly implementing something that you had proposed earlier and you said didn't work, which was this uh, make large steps when you're inside the body and make smaller steps when you get closer to the boundary. So you had you had and you had said um, okay this doesn't have the right convergence so there's a metropolis rule that you could use, but then something was wrong and and now it's not no longer wrong. But I I'm, I'm sorry. Ah, uh, it was not wrong earlier. It's just that when you use the metropolis filter, you you slow down enough that it doesn't give you any improvement. So the metropolis filter right. does ensure that you get the right distribution, mm -hmm. but then to make sure that the metropolis filter the uh, the probability of rejection is not too high, you have to make the balls or the ellipsoids uh, not too large. And, uh, 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 and and in this case, for example, uh, as I'll mention on the next slide, you could say, why are you sampling from exactly these ellipsoids? Why not sample from bigger ellipsoids? And what happens is that the rejection probability of the filter becomes too large. So it's not that it doesn't work. It's just that the to get it to work, you have to make small steps. So, so far, are, I see. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Uh, one more question? Yes. Um, so can you please remind us again what exactly you mean by a warm star and why that is a natural assumption? OK. Um, uh, warm star means that the initial point that you're uh, applying this, uh, that you're starting the process at, is already close to random. Close to random can be measured in multiple ways. Uh, one way is to say that the density from which the initial point is drawn is within a constant factor of the desired density. But in fact, it's enough if, it's, uh, 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 if, if this ratio is constant in expectation. Now, why is it natural? Um, uh, the point is that once you have a bound on the conductance, this is the guarantee that you get immediately. Now, there are uh, methods to generate a warm start from a cold start or a single point. Uh, so there is always sort of an extra factor 
which is what, uh, uh, what, what, what costs the algorithm to get the first random point. In all these cases, in all the walks I've talked about, this is an additional factor of n. So for the Dickin walk, for example, since we're here, the first point takes m times n squared, and every subsequent point takes m times n. Um, uh, in the case of other walks, uh, also, uh, so for example, for the ball walk, the first point takes n to the four, and then every subsequent point you get in whatever is the is the is the mixing time. So um, that takes additional ideas uh, and, and and algorithmic work, um, but just to focus on the on the sort of the uh, one aspect of it, I, uh, I, I I zoomed warm start for stating these theorems. Okay, um, I'll continue, but please interrupt. Uh, okay. So, um, as, as, as Thomas just did, why not make bigger steps? Why stop uh, with ellipsoids that just barely fit inside the body? Right? They, they, all of the, the Dickens ellipsoids do fit. Why stop with those? Uh, let's pick, pick, it, pick it from a blown up Dickens ellipsoid, right? Let's blow it up. Now, you, we don't want to blow it up too much. We want to blow it up enough so that when you pick a point from the ellipsoid, it's still likely to be in the set. It's okay to say probability half it's in the set, for example. And that lets you blow up by a lot. In fact, you can blow it up by a factor of nearly square root n, and it will still mostly lie in the set. So if you blow it up by this factor, a constant fraction of your Dickin ellipsoid, this blown up Dickin ellipsoid, still lies in the set. It's a huge I mean, factor root and larger steps. But here's the problem. And, and, and to see why this is the case, again, by a fine invariance, pretend that this, your Dickin ellipsoid is a ball, and you have these constraints. Now. You don't have to have your constraints contain this ball. You can push these constraints very close to the center of the ball. In fact, to within distance roughly 1 over square root n of the center of the ball. And since you have only m constraints, you can push them to within distance square root log m over root n distance, and you would still have most of the volume. Just because hyperplanes or half spaces that are at distance 1 over root n from the center cut off only a small fraction of the ball. So this volume, as long as these distances are bigger than uh, square root log m over n, are, is still a constant fraction. So you'd get to blow up by this much. But the problem is that the volumes of the ellipsoids at nearby points change very dramatically now. And so as a result, the rejection probability of the filter becomes too high. So in fact, if you want to maintain a decent rejection probability, like say a constant, the best thing you can do is stick with a constant factor Dickin ellipsoid. And, and optimizing the trade-off still gives you only a constant uh, Dickin ellipsoid. So this method, uh, uh, again, is, uh, is, hits the same bottleneck. OK, so, so uh, the barrier didn't help directly. And uh, 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 even though you know, it, 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 it was more natural in many ways, it was a fine invariant, and uh, steps were non-uniform. Um, how about uh, the other idea of continuous, uh, uh, a continuous process? So this, in in little font, is the is the is the Dickin walk. Um, now, if you look at what Dickin walk is actually doing, it's not symmetric around the current point if, in the ellipsoid. Here's what I mean uh, with the filter. Here's your current point. Is uh, pretend that your um, uh, set is just an interval. So I've drawn it's one dimensional. Here's your current point. Now that's the the barrier function, right? So these are the this is the the barrier. Now what's happening is that when you're trying to uh, sample from here, the ellipsoid you're drawing from is effectively an interval like this up here, which maps only to something small over here, and so because of your rejection probability, you have a drift, you know, a movement in this direction. If you're near the boundary, what the rejection probability is saying is you're not picking uniformly around you. In the, you are actually moving towards the center, right? Because you're rejecting points that take you away from the, take you closer to the boundary. And now let's consider this process uh, at its, you know, as the time goes to zero, the the, the step size. The time, instead of thinking of discrete steps, think of it as infinitesimal steps. If you did that to the ball walk, you get a Brownian motion. What what happens if we do this to the Dickin walk? See what happens in the Dickin walk is that 
the change in the current point as before you're applying a, a, a little Gaussian here DWT is a is a, an infinitesimal Gaussian and then but this Gaussian is not a standard Gaussian you're transforming it by some matrix which uh, depends on the on the um, uh, distances to the boundaries right this ellipsoid that we defined but in addition there is a drift towards in some direction that's based on where you are at the current point and this this the the, the sigma we've already defined it's just uh, the matrix that's defining the Dickin ellipsoid minus one half because this is a linear transformation and then uh, mu is what I'm calling the drift to the center we haven't yet characterized what this is but this is what's effectively happening okay. this is so sorry uh, this is without the uh, metropolis filter right no this is with the filter Without the filter, it's just going to go to the boundary. Hmm. If, the if without the filter, the walk the is... Sorry? The filter creates the drift. No, it creates the... the second exactly. The, the rejection probability creates the drift. Without the rejection probability, it's uh, it's it's um, uh, symmetric around the current point, and that just tends takes you to the boundary and sticks there. In, 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 in full space, it just keeps on drifting away from the initial point. But um, here, uh, because of the rejection step, uh, this you create this drift towards the middle and infinitesimally that's this is what this looks like okay so small just small question you said um if you did this um a, take the continuous limit for the ball walk you'd get brownian motion so that's brownian motion with reflection at the boundary is it or uh, uh okay it's a good question so we we we'd have to define the ball walk appropriately at the boundaries at the moment when we do just rejection step it doesn't correspond exactly if we do um reflection then yes that that would be the 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 uh brown in motion there but i was just talking about the analogy in full space so pretend there's no boundary then this is what uh, is happening in the ball walk case here of course to talk about this it, it only makes sense to talk about with the boundary uh, because we're talking about Dickin ellipsoids and so on and uh, yes uh, uh, this infinitesimal version the difference is the addition of this new term the the drift okay so does this actually give you a faster sampling so Brownian motion with drift is what we just said the next step is still from an infinitesimal Gaussian um, and uh, I already mentioned that, you know, if you look at this process with zero drift and uh, identity, so, so standard Gaussian, that's the heat equation. Um, but now the point is that, you know, this is not better than quadratic. If you didn't have drift, you still get quadratic, right? I mean, if, you, if you're doing uh, Brownian motion and you want to go to uh, some distance, uh, you need to spend uh, inverse quadratic time there. Uh, um, just because of uh, the way the way you're walking around. Now, can this drift actually make it faster? That's the that's the potential appeal of this. Will drift let you go faster than the best possible you could get with no drift? Okay. So looking back at this uh, differential equation, um, the the thing we'd like to take advantage of is the fact that every point has its own scaling its own ellipsoid, its own notion of measuring distance to other points. And given any such uh, stochastic differential equation, this uh, uh, Fokker-Planck equation says that you can think of this uh, uh, stochastic differential equation as corresponding also to a diffusion equation. Just like we have the heat equation corresponding to the case with no drift, there is a diffusion equation which says what happens to the probability uh, infinitesimally over time, uh, given that the points move according to this rule. Okay. Now, um, I don't expect you to necessarily parse this entire thing, only to see that uh, there is a there is a drift term showing up here and a uh, local scaling term showing up here. Now, the most general versions, the drift and the scaling can depend both on the current point and the time. In all of our uh, work where it's it doesn't change with time only with the current point so you could ignore that term. so 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 for any local scaling you get this diffusion equation here now you could ask based on this can we figure out what this drift is okay so here is the here is the uh, uh, 
the stochastic equation, the infinitesimal equation, simplified, where it depends only on the current point, not on the time. And uh, the corresponding diffusion equation looks like this, telling you the change in the probability densities. Okay, now what do we want? We want to know uh, what is the drift given that the distribution we want to approach is uniform, which means that the change in the distribution over time is zero. So to get that, we would need the left-hand side here to be zero. And when you do that, you get this simplified equation. And uh, the solution for the drift is the this uh, matrix sigma times its um, its um, uh, derivative. It's it's okay. Now that's uh, multivariable calculus, but the point of the slide is to point is to say that given that you have a desired stationary distribution, and that you fixed the metric, the local scaling at each point, the drift is completely determined. Okay, so what drift you should use is determined by the scaling to achieve the target distribution. Okay, so that was the drift. So there was no choice for the drift. It's already determined, which is nice. We don't have to make some arbitrary choice about this rejection probability. And indeed, even in the discrete setting, the rejection probability is determined by the stationary distribution you wish to use. Uh, but what so about the metric? Uh, yes. Just to confirm, so because uh, in the unrestricted walk, uh, sigma is independent of x, that is why there is no drift term because the derivative with respect to x is zero for sigma, so sigma prime is zero. Roughly. Well, in the unrestricted walk, there are many issues here. You see, we cannot talk about uh, stationary distribution. I see. Um, uh, in the unrestricted walk, uh, you just derive by other means that the you know we, we are explicitly not using any drift. Mm -hmm. um, that's the design of the walk. The mu is zero, and then you get if you look at what's left, it's the heat equation. Okay. But uh, um, once you have the possibility of a stationary distribution. Then you can say, if I want the stationary distribution, and I've already know what my metric is, uh -huh. what is the drift going to be at each point? And that turns out to have a clean solution. Okay. That's okay. Just to make sure, um, this this drift is just the continuous analog of the metropolis, which you already figured out. Is that correct? Uh, well, uh, 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 it is the continuous analog. Yes, uh, and we figured it out for that particular walk. But the hope is that looking at this more generally will suggest maybe a better process and corresponding drift. But you're right. This is the continuous analog of the rejection probability in the discrete setting. So, so your, your goal is to replace the Deakin with something else. Uh, and the hope is maybe you could um, improve the drift. I mean, the drift you lose by the because of the rejection. Is that, is that the reason you lose? Exactly. Why you so, okay. Exactly. Even though even though Dickin has the drift in a in the discrete analog of the drift, even though it has it, even though it has non-uniform metric and has drift, it still doesn't gain. Okay, because it turns out that if you try to make the you know the, the drift you'd have to choose to achieve your session distribution just doesn't give you an improvement in the in the in the in, in how big a step you can take and therefore the number of steps you need. But that was a particular realization. Of, of of this of this continuous process, right? You just make the discrete time, and and take the step according to the current x. What we'll see shortly is that in fact there are many other ways you could do it, and uh, one of them will be faster. Okay. By the way, everything I've said so far about SDEs is 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 is, is standard in that field, uh, um, um, and and completely unknown to me about uh, uh, two years ago. Uh, okay. So. Now, which metric to use? You know, which which uh, local scaling metric to use? A natural choice is the metric defined by the Hessian of a convex function. You know, then you get ellipsoids, then you get uh, 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 you know, positive definite matrices, and so on. Uh, and in, in, indeed, for optimization, this has been very beneficial. So, seems like a reasonable thing to try. So, if we take this, exp the, the replace the 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 uh, local metric with this Hessian of a convex function, so this matrix that's giving you the second derivatives, then I'm just replacing the sigma x with uh, this uh, Hessian to the minus half. That would be the, uh, the natural thing to do. So for the Dickin ellipsoid, nothing has changed. You just replace phi here with the log barrier. If you took phi to be the log barrier, this is what you get. Now, um, 
the drift again as we said before is completely determined and we can write it explicitly in terms of this hessian this is just calculus i'm taking this this sigma here and writing the sigma times its derivative okay now okay the question is um how should we simulate this i mean we'd like to uh, potentially simulate this better not the way we did it before by simply discretizing time is there a better way to discretize i mean really uh, uh, that's the question this the, the existence of this equation and it being natural is what i've argued in continuous time but can we turn this into an algorithm that's better than say the first attempt i'm okay. sorry Santosh, can I ask, you said this already but i was just just to summarize what, what you did because you started from the dickin walk and that gave you a particular convex function phi from which you could derive uh, a formula for the drift, but now you're saying, well, in general, there's no reason to use the particular phi that comes from the Dickin walk. I could use any convex function, and for any convex function, I have an associated drift, but you haven't told us yet what convex function you're going to use. That's one part of it. That's one okay. part of it that you have freedom to choose the convex function. But the other part, which turned out, turns out to be crucial, is that the Dickin walk is a particular way to discretize this, uh, this continuous process. It's a particular way to discretize this continuous process. Namely, at a current point, you're looking at the current metric and taking a discrete step according to the current metric. It's arguably a natural way to, to try to discretize the first thing you would do, and that's the Dickin walk. What I'm going to show you in the next few slides is, in fact, there's a very different way to do it uh, rather than just uh, you know uh, discretize uh, and take a step according to the current local metric. So not only is there there's freedom in the function, but even for the same function, the log barrier, let's say, there is a there's going to be a different discrete process which has the same continuous process as its limit. Okay. okay. Now, but the general question here is how do you discretize this? This is studied quite a bit because people like to you know, use Brownian motion as models for various things. But somehow not so much from a computational uh, complexity perspective. Um, so here is a candidate walk. Okay, so this was the this was the continuous process. So so here's what we we'll do. Uh, let's take an, a small time step h, and the current point moves by h times the drift, plus uh, um, this is the Gaussian infinite. Or this is the standard Gaussian at the current point, right? It's a standard Gaussian times the scaling factor, scaling matrix times square root h because you know, that, that would be the natural thing to do, right? So if, if you discretize in units h, then you're saying h times drift plus square root times h times a random according to the current ellipsoid. Now, this doesn't really make sense if you think about it. Why? If you're here out in Seattle, <laughs> where, where Yintad is, uh, uh, or, there, or, or actually, then it's telling you which direction to go uh, uh, you know, you're picking a random direction, that's W, so you pick uniformly here, and then you apply the ellipsoid given by this current point, it's some ellipsoid, and that ellipsoid tell, gives you a direction, and then basically you're taking the straight line in that direction, right, because you're moving in that direction after after applying some sh some mu. So you, you move a little bit, and then you apply apply a straight line. But you see, if you have these boundaries, you will hit a bottleneck. This sounds like a great direction to move locally, but you're going to hit a bound. You're going to hit a boundary if you try to take too big a step. So you'll, you 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 know you have to recompute something. Okay. So the point was that you're trying to take this step in the coordinate system of the current point. At least it's not a universal coordinate system. It's a coordinate system that's different for each point. But you're trying to take this step according to the current coordinate system. Doesn't make sense or doesn't seem right. And and again, I'm emphasizing this. This, by the way, this particular way of discretizing is the euler maruyama method for discretizing a stochastic differential equation. Uh, it's exactly what I wrote earlier. And it's not so great. Why? Because you're doing this, even though you picked your direction according to the local metric, your actual discretization is in Euclidean coordinates. And if this local metric changes a lot, right? If it changes a lot, then what the, this direction that looked good where you started is no longer good you know while you're making the step and you're ignoring that aspect so question is is there a more natural coordinate system 
we're already at the point where we can have a separate coordinate system for each point. So why not, you know, why, why, why are we taking the steps according to the a fixed coordinate system? And what we'd like to do is effectively keep the local metric constant, right? So, so it's, as, it's as if you are stepping according to the local metric at every step, rather than the local metric at the starting point. And this is the geodesic walk. Um, what we're going to be doing, and uh, all of this I'll explain in the next, uh, oh my goodness, it's 157. So <laughs> uh, I have, uh, I guess, uh, five minutes? Yeah, five minutes, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, uh, what we'd like to say is let's follow the shortest path in this direction W that we picked in the local metric. So you're following a direction W, and then you realize, hey, look, this W is actually a different direction locally now, and then a different direction locally, and that's the plan. So if you were here, this direction W actually is changing as you go along, and uh, you could potentially go infinitely far in that direction. Now I'm going to flash through some slides that put all of this in a, in a, or, or show you what the, 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 the mathematical way to formalize this is. And that's in the setting of Riemannian manifolds. We've already changed, moved from polytopes to these manifolds, right, by defining these functions. And um, uh, we think of distance not as Euclidean distance, but as the shortest path distance on this manifold, which is just a surface in a higher dimensional. Uh, setting, you could think of it as the as the surface of a convex body, or uh, and so on. Um, now each point has its own tangent plane, which we've talked about as a local metric, its local scaling, and that determines distances with respect to the current point. Um, uh, and lengths of curves are based on. You know, this is just the definition of the length of the curve. If you were in Euclidean, this length would always be Euclidean length. But since the notion of length is changing as you move, you're just measuring the change according to the current notion of length. So that's length. And distance, as I said, is the minimum distance over all paths. So that's a metric, that's the Riemannian metric. The, the important thing, a definition here is a geodesic, which is a locally shortest path. So given a direction, you can talk about a locally shortest path. So if you're at this current point X, and I want to talk about this direction here, you can ask, well, how should I be moving on this surface so locally I'm taking the shortest path, okay? like great circles on a sphere. And uh, the final notion is this exponential map, which is just telling you that if you want to make a certain step in the direction, where would you end up if you were to follow the actual shortest path? Not just the straight line, but the actual shortest path in that direction, if you follow the geodesic, where would you end up? And that's the entire idea of the walk. We're going to not step according to the straight line drawn from the current point, but the shortest path on the metric in that direction. And so uh, I'll skip this, but here is the walk. In the tangent plane at X, you're picking a standard Gaussian. Okay. And then you're uh, uh, applying the drift and this Gaussian, that's giving you, this is just the choice of direction. Where do you go next in the tangent plane? But then this exponential map is taking you to the point you would reach if you went this far or if you went along this, this vector in the, in the actual manifold, but kept going on the shortest path. Um, now, <laughs> if we just did this, the walk would not be symmetric. It would be great if it had been symmetric, but it's not symmetric. The probability of going from x to y and y to x could be different. So, and in fact, there are many possible, in principle, there are many directions that take you to the same point. So what we have to do is compute a, a reverse step. So what is a w prime? So that if you were to start from the point where you arrived and go back, you'd come back to this x. And you accept with probability that's the minimum of these two ratios. So again, this is just the metropolis filter, but we're applying it to the transition probabilities of this walk. That of course raises two questions. What's the rate of convergence and how to implement this? Now, um, we already mentioned it's better than the straight line. Now the number of iterations uh, is m times n to the 3 fourths. I said that for the polytope with log barrier. For a cube, it turns out it's only n to the 1 third. Um, the ball walk and hit and run are gonna take you n squared no matter what, the Dickens walk takes you n. And uh, this is taking you n to the 1 third steps only. Um, 
Uh, in fact, this, this bound for the log barrier is a special case of a much more general theorem for manifolds. And the key question just again becomes how large of a step size can you take? This is not meant for you to read, but this is just showing you that you have to connect the analysis of the convergence back to the, to the properties of the manifold and, uh, and, uh, and this is what we get for the log barrier. Um, what turns out to be difficult in this proof is showing that the rejection probability is small and that one step distributions are, are smooth, so they overlap a lot. The isoperimetry part turns out to be easy and follows from known results. Um, now, I'm just going to put up, this is the one step distribution. It's a little bit more complicated than hit and run. Uh, and we show that, you know, for, for small but not too small step size, these things are bounded. Now, here's the, the last two picture slides I want to draw. You see, the, if you're on some manifold, on some surface that looks like this, the probability of going from X to Y and Y to X can look very different even if you're following geodesics. Here you are, you pick a random direction, and if you try to follow them, you could end up somewhere there. Whereas if you start there and you try to follow them, you know, there's no reason that the chance of picking this geodesic is the same from both directions. In fact, they're not. And that's the picture I have here on the board behind me. Um, you see, if you have a um, point here and a point there, you know, this point spreads out much more compared to that point. So it's much more likely that that point ends up here than this point goes there. And we have to correct and analyze this, which, um, you know, uh, turns out to be uh, more tricky for, uh, for, for the geodesic walk. Things are easier for the ball walk and not so easy for the geodesic walk. I will, I think, now jump to... Um, the, I, I had slides up for what happens in one dimension, which, tends, uh, uh, and which is sufficient to analyze the cube. And there you exactly pick up the self-concordance parameter. Uh, anyway, that's the cube analysis. Uh, the cost per iteration is important because you could ask, how do you actually implement the geodesic walk? You know, how do you compute this exponential map? And how do you compute this ratio of the probabilities? After all, we're given an explicit polytope, nothing else. No further assumption. These things turn out to be uh, uh, ordinary, ordinary differential equations, solutions to differential equations. And uh, we need to do them fast. So what we're able to show is that in fact, they can, the, the, the types of differential equations that show up here have solutions that can be approximated by low degree polynomials. And therefore the per step complexity, solving these ODEs is only matrix multiplication time. Um, I, the, the, the analysis of these ODEs tends out to be very nice um, uh, and uses some clean, uh, calculus uh, rules, but, um, and, and, uh, and has some other applications. You know, solving ODEs is, is of independent interest, um, but I'll skip that since we're running out of, we are, we are out of time. Uh, uh, um, the last part of the analysis is to show that the things we want to approximate, like the geodesic, are in fact close to low degree polynomials and Lipschitz. How do you show something as close to a low degree polynomial? Well, the standard way for one variable functions you use to use to use the Taylor series that doesn't quite work for us, um, but you could use in higher, uh, the, the Cauchy estimate again. That's great for one-dimensional functions. What do you do for multi-dimensional functions? So we reduce the bounding of derivatives of multi-dimensional functions to one-dimensional functions, and for those we use the fact that these are very nice functions uh, uh, because the barriers are such smooth convex functions, and that uh, gives you. Uh, uh, that the step size you can make is one over square root n. Uh, and, and, and as a result, you get this m, n to the three, four. Okay, <laughs> trying to finish. Uh, uh, it, it would be nice to analyze this uh, walk for other barriers. A promising barrier is the least hid foot barrier, the one that gives the fastest algorithms for linear programming. Uh, the analysis here seems to be more complicated. Um, maybe improve the analysis of even this for log barrier. And it's possible that instead of m times n to the three quarters, it's m times square root n. And disprove or prove our generalized scaleless conjecture, uh, which I haven't yet stated. So faster max flow or uh, uh, optimization would be nice. This notion of being able to go on a long geodesic, maybe that's related to, to those problems as well. Faster sampling. Uh, and uh, one problem for ODEs uh, is a uh, faster ODE our solution takes time polynomial in the Lipschitz constant. Maybe it's possible to do logarithmic in that. Uh, and here is the, I'll conclude with this generalized scaleless conjecture. Here's what it's saying. This is the isoperimetry or expansion of a subset. But now all I've done is change the distance to be the distance according to some um, 
convex map functions Hessian and we're just saying is it true that the minimum is achieved by a hyperplane cut a two within a constant factor that is the KLS conjecture for the Euclidean metric could it possibly be true for any uh, metric induced by a Hessian of a convex function there's lots of things you might possibly want to do with their manifolds uh, learn test model things uh, and uh, there are very nice questions about just the Markov chains themselves we give uh, uh, bounds on the mixing rate. It would be nice to be able to determine on the fly that you're random uh, to make things. It seems to be a fundamental question from probability also. Okay, I'll stop here and take some questions for anybody's left. Okay, thank you, Sandosh. Any, any questions? Uh, actually, one quick question. Um, how tight is your analysis, say, for the cube? You know that n to the one third is the right. Number yes, for, for the cube, it's tight because, um, in fact, the cube analysis just depends on one uh, D, uh, analyzing an interval. You know, the cube is a product distribution, and the entire process can be viewed as a as a uh, uh, happening independently on the coordinates. As a result, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just going back to those slides since I have that. But as a result, um, it's enough to analyze an interval. And uh, the analysis for the interval, uh, here we go. For the interval, what we get is uh, this. Uh, uh, the, in order to keep all the transition probabilities, you know, the rejection probability small, you just have to keep the step size to the three halves small, which just means that you can actually take step sizes that are constant. If you had one-dimensional interval, you can take constant step sizes. So in a, in a one-dimensional interval, you mix in constant time. Okay, so maybe that's not uh, so... Uh, I mean, all directions to, all the directions to um, succeed, right? So this exactly. Like end, right? exactly, exactly. So, so when you go to n dimensions, it's a product of intervals. Your log barrier is this. And if you view them as independent processes, so this, this rejection probability is the bottleneck. And what it shows you is that to get this ratio, you can think of it as a sum of the ratios because, and these are independent things now, each of these has to be controlled as a constant, right? And so if, if you know, the bound we get here, if you have step size h, is square root n times h to the three halves. You know, the square root n is the usual thing. You add up n, n independent random things and you get a square root n bound uh, uh, overhead. And so you need to keep this less than a constant so that you're, you're, you have a good chance of accepting the step. And that tells you that h is n to the minus one third. Um, for what it's worth, uh, it's, 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 it's implementable because you know, MATLAB has ODE solvers and, uh, you can, and ODE solvers are just iterative processes. So uh, you can run this in, in, in several dimensions. Question? Yes, I have a question. So I think this problem, like this kind of geometric uh, work problem is also interested in the quantum setting, for instance, like there are, there are some spatial work search paper in quantum algorithm, then basically we can get a quadratic speed up. So have you thought about any kind of quantum algorithm for this problem? I, uh, I will uh, uh, defer that, that question, question to Oded or uh, Thomas. <laughs> uh, just because I know, the answer is no, I haven't thought about it. And I don't know enough about the quadratic speed up. I remember results saying that quantum walks are faster by polynomial factors, but I just don't have the intuition to give you a reliable answer. Okay, so answer this. Let's take the broadcast offline, but everyone is welcome to stay and ask more questions. And again, hope to see you all in two weeks for Avishai Tal's talk. And uh, thank you again, Santosh. Thanks. So, uh,